Now, today's class is our Getting Results class. This is kind of our round two or intermediate class. Uh, we teach a, a round one getting started class that's more of a, of a tour and what you've got and how to use it and things like that that covers the general basics. Uh, by the way, our training schedule uh, is on our pipeline website. And uh, just to give you a quick idea of some of the other things we talk about, uh, Mondays and Fridays is our round one. We call that the Kickstarter. Uh, there's two different chances to, to catch that. And then on Tuesdays and today is our results class. So we cover that twice a week as well. Uh, now the class that we teach tomorrow is uh, an Ask Us Anything session. And what that means is we let you guys call the shots on Thursdays. You tell us what kind of things you're interested in. Uh, if there's a curriculum or a, or a problem or, or something you want to see in action, Thursdays can be just about anything. But moving along with uh, today's curriculum, the idea is uh, you've got a website. Let's make sure that you're doing the right stuff with it in order to actually get hits, get leads, and hopefully also get business, not just leads, but people who actually come to the closing with you. Now, before we get into specific things that, uh, that, that you can do, it helps to know who you're targeting, what they want, why they should contact you and set some goals around that. It's easy to, to sit down and say, I want more hits or I want more leads, but that's such a, a gray area. That could mean different things to different people. It's better to actually jot down that I want more of this type of business, this type of person. I want to sell more of these types of products. Uh, that way you can actually chart that sort of thing. Um, it also helps because uh, some of the things we're going to be talking about as we go along really do involve targeting somebody in particular. You've got to think about your audience, not just in general, because if you think in generalities, you're going to blend in too much. Um, it's easy to say my target is real estate, but people buy and sell different stuff for different reasons. Uh, same thing with loans. People borrow, they refi, there's so many different loan products out there and even problems and solutions that may come up. So if you think about specific things as we go along, the who you're targeting, what they want, and why they should contact you, the who, what, why is a good thing to keep in mind because those three things should really help you come up with the content that we use whenever we start talking about how to put together a page or an email campaign or a social media post uh, or how to market yourself when we start talking about the, uh, the marketing tools during the second half of the class. So there's a couple of different ways that this can go. Once you know who you're targeting, um, we're going to talk about different ways to get those types of people to your site. That may include search engine results, or they may be following a link from a professional directory, a yellow page site, a social media page. Uh, we're going to talk about all of those different things. But then once they find your site, that isn't the end of the story. You don't just want hits, you want leads too. You want them to fill something out or you want them to subscribe to hear more from you. Uh, get your newsletter or, or uh, uh, regular email campaigns or social media updates or something like that to where they're going to tune in to where if they're not ready to close now, they can pay attention to you uh, and then you'll be top of mind whenever they are ready. So this is the, the big picture. Now there's actually uh, two things um, that I want to mention about this big picture. Um, one is um, we need to come up with a, we need to follow this kind of big picture model because technology is different these days. Uh, a lot of search engine uh, marketing gurus don't use the acronym SEO anymore uh, because these days you can't really optimize for the search engine because you're not trying to impress Google, you're trying to impress the public. And Google and the other big search engines are smart enough these days that they're trying to look for things that a visitor wants. So that's one reason that we're going to a, a big picture model versus just making this a search engine class. Uh, another reason is I really want to make sure that we don't just get you more hits, but we do end up getting you more leads in business in the long run. We're going to talk about all the different pieces that generate not just hits but results in general. Now talking about the technology here for a little bit, that's what usually intimidates a lot of people. Uh, and a lot of that is this used to be a very technical way of, uh, of trying to earn more business. It used to require quite a bit of effort to get on the web. But search engines started realizing that competition was going way, way up, and a lot of those competitors had deep pockets, and they could always outspend you or hire better techs. Uh, that wasn't really a very fair way of doing it, because a lot of those big sites didn't have as 
good a content as the little guys who were really passionate about stuff. A lot of people were starting up little blogs and just talking very plainly about good stuff that somebody would love to read, and that stuff was way more useful than the sponsored ads that were floating around out there by the big guys. Search engines figure people want to see those little guys, so they wanted to find ways to level the playing field. Another reason is a lot of your competition, even the smaller ones, it's really easy for anybody to get online. So they had to come up with some other logic to say, now that we're focusing on the little guys, there's a bunch of you. How do we tell which little guys are really worth the attention? So what it boils down to these days, instead of the technology and the platform and the investments you have to make, is search engines are going to look at everything that you're doing, and uh, they're going to look at what we call signals. Uh, these are things that sign to the search engine that you've got what somebody wants, that somebody might appreciate you, and that you're a somebody. Um, so it's not about technology tricks like it used to be. It's about having the right content and then backing that content up with some good promotion. Uh, the promotion model that we're going to cover today is called inbound marketing, which is measured in creativity rather than budget. We want to make sure that all the stuff we cover today, none of it costs anything. So you're not losing anything uh, out of your budget uh, to try some of these things to get better results. So because we can't target the search engines anymore, since we can't use SEO, search engine optimization, but since search engines are still a part of it, we need a different model to follow, a different game plan to tackle. So since most marketing gurus don't use the phrase SEO anymore, this is the phrase that they do use. They use a phrase called OCDC, and that stands for optimizing your content for discovery and conversion. This is a bigger picture than just SEO by itself. Now, SEO does play a role uh, in it, but First, we start by focusing on your content. We've got to make sure you've got the right pages. We've got to make sure those pages are easy for somebody to get through, uh, not buried in a million other pages. They can access it anywhere from any device, uh, that whenever somebody looks at it, it's remarkable, it's unique, it's delightful. And then once you've got the right goods, we promote that to make sure that you're discovered uh, whether this is through search engines, so this is where SEO would come in, or whether they're going to follow links and other marketing efforts and some of the other things we're going to talk about. And then not only do we, do we talk about being discovered, but we talk about the conversion as well. It'd be great if you had an awesome website and you got a million hits, but it wouldn't do you any good if nobody ever contacts you because of it. So this OCDC model does cover all of that in one package. Now here's what OCDC looks like from a technical perspective before we start narrowing this down into the, the bread and butter. Uh, and I'll be talking about these individual slices of the pie here in a little bit. Uh, but first I want to mention a little bit about um, where I got this model. I didn't come up with this pie chart. This came from a company called Moz. I'd like to introduce them to you real quick. Let me pull up a page of theirs. Now, Moz is basically an internet think tank. There's a bunch of different people who contribute to Moz from a bunch of other companies. Uh, over here on the right, you can see a long list of people who they chime in whenever it comes to trying to get some sound bites on what helps people's rank positively or negatively. They keep up with the latest Google updates, and they get together every year and try to build a comprehensive survey that people like me can take a look at and figure out what kind of things we should tell you guys that you should be doing with yourselves. Now this particular page, it gets rather technical. There's a lot of different metrics in there. But what I did was I tried to come up with the best talking points. Uh, and actually, I've got a simpler version than this that we're going to start covering on the next couple of slides. But before I get into that, I did want to show you the split between the big picture here. You can almost divide this into two things evenly. On the right, you've got the blue slices of the pie. And these are all the things that you do to your site, whether it's content or branding or making it easier to use or easier to understand. Uh, all the stuff that's on the blue on the right side are things we do to your site. And all the things that we do on the left, the red slice of the pie, are things that we do with your site or with your branding and contact info that we, that we put this off-site. And this tries to get you some reputation and some votes and links and other sources of traffic and things along those lines. So this is the, the two main things we're going to talk about today are the content side and the marketing side. But right in between them, we're also going to talk about lead capture too, uh, some good pitches and strategies and things along those lines. 
Now, a quick summary before we get into the the actual steps here. The golden motto here is if you if you focus on making people happy it's going to help make search engines happy as well I do want this to be a one a two birds with one stone approach um, really if, if you focus on making people happy then even if you only get a couple of hits those hits are going to be more likely to contact you so keep them at the front of your mind don't worry so much about impressing Google a lot of times search engines are going to be smart enough to figure this stuff out on their own as long as we're doing the right stuff here now, um, back on the, the pie chart a little bit, that the blue slices of the pie, the things that had to do with your content, add up to about 51%. Uh, that's all about having what somebody wants and being clear about it. But 49% of the score, that's, all, that's just a little less than half, are things you do off-site. So just having an awesome site is not enough. Even if you have a great site, it'll really only take you a little bit more than halfway there. Now also, if I go back to that pie chart for just a minute, some of these slices of the pie don't look like very big numbers. Behavioral and mobile functionality, which means how easy is the site uh, on a, a phone or what do people do with the site, that says 7%. But if you have a site that's hard to use or they can't access it on a phone, you're going to see an effect on your bottom line. And it's not going to be 7% of your profit. It's probably going to be a bigger number than that. Uh, and social media only says about 6%. So just because you see a small number doesn't mean it's unimportant. Those small numbers may not mean much to a robot, but it may mean a bunch to your visitors. Um, also, one of those slices of the pie may be the only thing that you're really missing out on from being able to bump ahead of a couple of your competitors. So all of it should be considered. So as we go through, I'm going to talk about a bunch of different things you can try. Consider taking a look at all of them. It may be the, the only piece of the puzzle, pissing, uh, the puzzle piece that's missing there. But again, the golden rule is instead of optimizing for search engines, optimizing for your visitors is the core here. Search engines should be able to just figure this stuff out. And I'm going to try and keep the tech stuff to an absolute minimum so that you do think about people rather than thinking about bots. Now we're going to get into the actual uh, pie chart. So um, I wanted to summarize all the blue pieces in one swoop if I could because a lot of this stuff flows into each other very well. Uh, you can use this as a bit of a checklist. In fact, I am going to make sure that everybody who's here today gets a copy of these slides and this page right here is basically your content checklist. Um, the main rule for this is you have to have what somebody wants. Bottom line, if somebody wants a particular property type or a loan product or a solution to a transaction problem or something, you've got to have it or you won't rank if they Googled it uh, or if they clicked on your site to check you out anyway and that's what they wanted, they're not going to stick around. They're going to go fishing elsewhere and see if they can find somebody who does have it. So this is one of the main reasons why at the beginning I recommended making a list of who you're targeting and what they might want and try to predict that. However, one worry to that is if you're targeting a bunch of people and those people have a bunch of needs individually, you could end up with a pretty big list. So here's the real trick. While you're doing this, you have to keep your whole site useful, relevant, and focused. Or basically, you have to pick your battles. Somebody isn't going to like pulling up a website that's got a million buttons and categories they have to come through. The harder they have to think, the less likely they are to stick around and choose you. So you should really figure out if some of those content topics that you're jotting down, are they really worth it? Is somebody going to choose you because you've got it? Or is it going to solve something that's in the way of them choosing you? Is there an obstacle that that somebody would throw up their hands and say, I'm not ready for this, unless you had a page about it that removes the obstacle, now they're ready for you? Basically, turn on pages that drive action. Don't have something just to have it. If you got something just to have it, it's going to make your site harder to use. It may be neat, but does it really get somebody to contact you because you've got that? So try considering almost anything that you jot on that list may end up being on the chopping block. You've got to have a really easy website. Uh, let me give you a quick example. I'm going to pull up a website. Now this will be a, a pretty oversimplified version of what I'm getting at, but let's say you're targeting both buyers and sellers, and there's so many different things that a buyer or a seller may want. Now you can have a menu that has 40 or 50 items in it, but the trick to that would be organizing it plainly. Buyers know where to go, sellers know where to go, and when they open up these drop-downs, 
there's less than a dozen things in there. They don't have to look through too many items to figure out the mortgage saving tips they wanted to read about. Or somebody who's shopping, there's a bunch of shopping links over here as well. Uh, I'll actually talk about shopping tips here in a little bit for the for the real estate people. Uh, I'll also have some mortgage tips coming up here pretty soon. But all the menu items on that site, none of it is cluttered. None of it would be too hard for somebody to get through. Keep that learning curve way down if you can while still focusing on the most important stuff that somebody would come to your site hoping to find. Now for point three here, is your brand known already? Now I don't mean are you a part of a big franchise like Keller Williams or Remax or anything like that. What I really mean is um, are you a somebody? And ways to show that you're a somebody may involve having testimonials on your pages. It may involve having reviews and ratings on other websites, which I'll actually make sure we talk about in the second half of the class when we talk about off-site stuff to do. But basically you need to show that you are a legitimate person uh, and some of this involves as point four here mentions having your contact info throughout the website uh, and not just phone numbers or email addresses but also physical addresses too and a note about that um, it's still kind of in debate how much this plays a role in your search engine rank but it has been shown that search engines prefer street addresses suite numbers they like things where somebody could actually show up at that physical location and meet with you but they're not a big fan of PO boxes it hasn't been proven how much they'll penalize you if if you have a PO box on your site but if there is a way to put a physical address on your site that has been shown to help with with so with search engines trusting you just a little bit more because they assume visitors can trust you too. But while we're talking about these, something that is definitely important is if you've got contact info on your website, such as the phone number here, make sure that phone number is all over the place. Go through your site, make sure that you don't have any old phone numbers hiding anywhere. Search engines don't like that either. They don't like ambiguity to where they worry if some of your pages might be out of date or incorrect. Or when we, when we start talking about the off-site stuff we do, like when I start talking about how to sign up on yellow pages and things like that, make sure that it's the same contact info there too. So the search engines see that it's that phone number on yellow pages, it's that phone number on your home page too. Now some of this I'm hoping you guys already have handled and, and uh, um, you know, shouldn't be something you have to put on your to-do list, but again, I'm trying to talk about the big picture. Make sure that you don't trip over anything that could be a really simple fix for you guys. Now on point five, here's where we start talking about some things that actually start setting you apart. Uh, both search engines and visitors like to see something new, and they don't like to see something that's old and stale that's been around forever and hasn't been updated. Um, uniqueness and freshness, basically. Now, we have built into our platform a special tool that we call Ghostwriter, and Ghostwriter is designed to give you a safe foundation to where your site already comes unique, and we'll take care of a little bit of freshness for you as well, so that hopefully you can write this off, uh, unless there's ways that you want to go beyond that and earn some more brownie points from the search engines and your visitors. But to show you what Ghostwriter does, I'm going to go ahead and log into our dashboard. I'll be spending a little bit more time on here on the next slide, by the way, showing you some content tricks. But for now, I'm going to click here where it says Website Content Page. And this will start by pulling up a list of our provided content pages. Now, everybody's site gets a provided list of pages. Um, these will already be turned on in a lot of the case. Um, you'll see the check boxes over on the left. The ones that are checked are the ones that you have turned on in your menu right now. But uh, let me start with this page right here, Nine Steps to Owning. Now, I'm at a real estate site. It'll be a little different for the mortgage sites. But if you're on a real estate site as well, you're going to have this page too, but your version is going to be different from my version. Same thing for any other sites that are out there. And the way that we do this is we have Ghostwriter work over this page before we hand you the keys. Now, I can run Ghostwriter right now to show you what I mean, but first I'm going to grab this, just this sentence right here, and I'm going to paste this into a text document. Now, I'm going to run Ghostwriter, and I'm going to get another version of that sentence. Now, I can run Ghostwriter by hitting this button right here that says Rewrite Page, and I'll hit OK. And I'm going to grab a sentence from that same spot, and I'm going to paste that into my text document. And I'll do it one more time, so we've got three versions. Let me grab that other sentence from the same spot. 
I'm going to pull that text document over so you can look at what it did. Now, the first version said buying a home is intimidating for most people. Now, the second version said for most people buying a home can be a stressful event. A little different, same idea, different phrasing. And then this one actually moved it to the end. The, the event intimidates many people. And the second half of the sentence is, this, is similar too. Is it very difficult with some upfront planning? With a little upfront planning, it's not very complicated. Purchasing a home isn't all that complicated. So we got three different versions of the same idea. Now it's not just that one sentence that gets worked over. Every part of the page gets ghostwritten. The headline gets mixed up, the second, the third sentence, even the clip art gets rearranged too. So if I hit rewrite page one more time and scroll down and find that image, we've got a new image that time as well. So with all these different pieces being rewritten, uh, by the time we roll the dice on every facet of that page, you've got about a one in a six million chance that you've got the same content as anybody else. So this stuff is already unique before we hand you the keys, basically. This means you don't have to worry about rephrasing this stuff. Search engines look at it and they don't think that they have seen these exact pages before. Now, this does mean that when you're coming up with your own stuff, you better watch out before borrowing content from elsewhere. Don't copy and paste, even if it's from somewhere that's really good, like Wikipedia or something like that. Um, if, you, if you can rephrase it in your own words, all the better, because that's what search engines are doing. They're comparing your exact phrasing with somebody else's exact phrasing. If it's too close, you get dinged for it, basically. So you've got to have uniqueness. Now, the second thing I was talking about on this point is freshness. Not only does a site have to look like it's new or look like it's different, but it has to look like things are changing every now and then. Now, it was pretty easy for me to just hit rewrite page, and there I had a brand new page, but you can also automate that too. So if you like how our nine steps to owning page works, if you like all nine steps and what they have to say, and you just want us to ghostwrite that for you over and over and over so that you get regular updates, then over here on the right side of this page, is a little refresh icon just before the green pencils. If you click on this, you can turn Ghost Rider on using this first checkbox and tell us how often you want a new version of that page. Now I've got these staggered out a little bit. This one is at 60, this one's at 60, this one is at 90. I recommend playing around with the interval a bit. Don't do everything at once because that's not how a website gets updated. You don't usually sit down and touch every page of your site in one swoop. You'll do a little now and a little later. So if you play around with the interval a little bit on a per page basis, it'll look a little bit more natural that way. Now, there will be times when you won't want to use Ghost Rider. If you take this nine steps to owning page and you add a tenth step, or you whittle it down to five or something like that, then I wouldn't turn Ghost Rider on because the next time we swoop back in on that page, we're going to put them back to nine and we're going to say the same stuff we were saying before. It's got a model that it follows because we teach it some safe things to say, but we can't do that if you go in there and you say your own stuff. Now, message in the end is way more important than freshness, so if you have something special to say, by all means, go in there and say it. But whenever you're done, don't turn Ghost Rider back on. You'll notice that I have the icon off on my home page. It's a dim gray versus that bright blue that shows that it's on. Uh, your home page is something that you probably don't want to have ghost written. You want to welcome people a certain way, basically. Now, don't worry if you turn on Ghost Rider or if you turn off Ghost Rider uh, too many places on your site. There isn't any sort of quota for freshness or updates that you have to hit. Search and you just want to see that something changes every now and then. Even just starting up a blog may be the only thing you need to do to make sure that your ranking holds its place and you won't get penalized if the rest of your site sits still. Now, for this point right here, does your everything work on mobile? All you got to do to make sure that the answer to this question is yes is go to Google and do their uh, mobile friendly test. So I'm going to go to Google, mobile friendly test, and the first result is a test that Google offers officially. Now you'll want to plug in your website address. I'll go ahead and do that now. Now, it's going to slow down here for a little bit, and it'll take a couple minutes to complete. But while that's doing, I want to talk about some ways to earn some brownie points on mobile friendliness. Um, search engines really love it if you don't have a desktop site 
and a mobile site because that's two different documents. They may worry that if somebody is on one device versus another device that they might miss something. Maybe you've got it on the desktop version but you don't have that tool on the mobile version. Search engines don't like that. They want to have confidence that no matter what somebody is using to find you, they can find that content as well. So a way that we do our sites in order to make sure that you get the full brownie points there is this is what it looks like on a desktop and if you want to see what it looks like on a mobile, just shrink down your screen and here's your mobile version. It is one fluid document. Whether you're pouring water into a drinking glass or a fishbowl, it takes the shape of the container that it's put in. So this is how we make sure that your site works the same way regardless of whatever somebody chooses to use to find you basically. Now here's the results of that test and we did get a passing score. Now if you get a failure on this, call our hotline, we'll take a look at the technical jargon that'll be over here on the sidebar. Google will tell you why you failed basically and we can, we, we can analyze that and tell you why you got that and how to fix it in the end basically. All right, now for these last two points, these aren't things that you actually do to your site. These aren't content things that you've got to have. These are th where search engines actually start spying a little bit on what people do with your website. They actually track how much time does somebody spend on your website, uh, how many pages do they click on. Um, now, what this basically means on this next to last point here, to visitors stick around and read, is search engines want to see that somebody visits more than just your home page. They go from your home page to another page, and then hopefully another and another. The more pages that they click on, the more interesting search engines think that you are. Also, they want to see that somebody spends more than a couple of seconds on a page. If they spend 30 seconds versus 3 seconds, they figure that they actually camped out and they read what you had to say. If it was a longer period of time, you must have been really interesting. So search engines do care what somebody does. And the only way to really control this is to have stuff that's worthy of somebody's attention, uh, things that are unique, which we'll be talking about on the next slide. I'll be making some content recommendations. But uh, be thinking about this and, and try to find ways to get somebody to visit more of your pages and spend more time on those pages. Now, the last point is kind of related to that. Uh, do, do people leave your site and choose someone else's site instead? Search engines do take a look at when somebody is on Google and they click on this result. If they come back and then they click on this result and they spend more time here and visit more pages here than they did here, they're going to consider having this site trade places with this site. And number one becomes number two. Number two becomes number one. Search engines do watch if somebody who was on the same results page with you kept a visitor for longer and had them do more stuff, they're going to consider tr having them outrank you, basically. You want it to be the other way around. You want to be more interesting than the other guys, so you outrank them. They do compare you to the company you're in, basically. So now to talk about ways to make sure that people do stick around and read and don't go elsewhere and, and find your competition more interesting, we got to make sure that you have the right content. So here's the fine print to that. This is the closing of the content part of today's class. Now content is still king and Ghostwriter will get you started with some unique and fresh stuff, but in order to make sure that you're as interesting as possible, we got to make sure you have the right specialty content. You got to have something different. What's going to set you apart? Now, when, when I was talking about at, at the very beginning, planning who you're targeting and what they may want and why they may contact you, the who, the what, and the why, basically, uh, hopefully these are going to be the things that you want to highlight. Uh, on real estate, you, you, you should really emphasize listings pages first and foremost. People do want to shop, but the downside is that listings are kind of a cheap commodity. You're up against Zillow and Homes.com and Realtor.com and visitors don't really know the difference between your data and their data and they're not going to stick around long enough for you to explain that sort of thing to them. So um, what you should consider doing is make listings easier to find. Now pulling up that uh, website again that I'm using today. Oops, I typed it in wrong. Here we go. Sorry about that. Okay, so starting off, I've got a search widget right here, but so does Trulia and Zillow and Homes.com. So first impression, I don't see anything that's really remarkable about this search versus everybody else's search. However, when I explore this fine properties menu up here, I've already got settings for Oklahoma City, Edmond, Nichols Hills, Mesta Park, 
Deer Creek Schools. And if that's exactly what I want, rather than trying to figure out how to find that using this widget, I'm just going to click Deer Creek Schools. And this is the sort of thing that your competition probably won't be doing. Even the big guys like Zillow and Trulia, they probably don't have this same easy local specific menu. And here it is. Here's those listings. And if I want to fine tune it from there, I can. But right here, I've shown somebody why I'm different versus the big guys. They can't find local stuff like that on the big guys very easily. Now, I also recommend considering having area information. Uh, I'm going to talk about this a little bit later on, but basically area information is something that your competition doesn't sit down and do very often. They don't talk about neighborhoods and country clubs and places to live and attractions and things along those lines. Uh, transaction pitfalls are a good thing to talk about as well. Now, this goes for not just real estate, but for mortgage as well. What obstacles are in somebody's way, and if you remove those obstacles, could they choose you at that point? Are they having trouble getting qualified or finding the right program for them? Do they need to make repairs before they sell? Are they in over their head and need to sell now urgently? Uh, those are the sort of things that people might type in without knowing the exact technical jargon. But if you have a plain page that says, I can help you get out from under your loan, that thing is called a short sale, and here's what that means, and explain it to them, then you're going to be more likely to come up. Um, also, there's different reasons that people buy and sell. So keep in mind those reasons. Are they upgrading? Are they downsizing? Do you want to specialize in any of those things? Now, getting into mortgage here for a little bit, at the forefront, it, it is mostly about just loan types and financing programs and things along those lines. But keep in mind, transaction pitfalls and borrowing problems. Uh, those are one of the main things that people are worried about. Credit score, getting their ducks in a row, figuring out what they have to have in order to apply and things along those lines. Uh, a lot of our provided content can take care of some of this, but keep in mind the sort of things that come up in your day-to-day -day basis that maybe your website could solve as well. If people are approaching you about it in the real world, then they'll pr they're probably Googling for this stuff as well, and you might catch new people like that. So having talked about some different kinds of pages you might create, now I want to go through a page uh, and start analyzing the anatomy so that when you're putting these things together, you've got some tricks in your bag that can help focus these pages, not just for, for search engines, but for visitors too. And the first signal I want to talk about is putting a headline on the page. Now, a headline is exactly what it sounds like. It's bigger and bolder than anything else on the page. It'll get a visitor's attention. It, it stands out visually. But search engines use headlines to summarize big blocks of text. So I'm going to open up the dashboard again and go to website content page. And uh, now I'm going to create a, uh, a custom page. Now, all of our provided pages should already have some of this stuff in there. Feel free to edit it if you want to make changes to the other pages, headlines, and the other things I'm about to talk about. But I'm going to do it from a custom page just for the, the clean presentation of it. Now, actually, I've already started a page called Relocating to Oklahoma City. But if you need to make a page, down here is an Add New button, and that'll start a blank page. But I'm just going to play with this one. Now you can see I've already got some plain text in here, but I'm going to make this text a little less plain. I'm going to put in those signals that will help things stand out. And of course we're talking about headlines here, so what I want to do is take this line of text up at the top and make it bigger and bolder than anything else. Now I can bold it or choose a size, but this far left drop down actually has some built-in presets. There's a heading 1, which is kind of big. Heading two, maybe that's still too big, so I'm going to knock it down to a three. It's a little nicer. I think I'm going to leave it like this. Now, when it comes to picking a headline, if you're doing any of your own search engine research, you might find some articles that talk about an H1 versus an H2 versus an H3. Um, now, those articles may tell you that a one is worth more than a two, a two is worth more than a three, basically like you're numbering them in order of importance. Now, those articles aren't technically incorrect. They're just out of date. The bigger search engines, Google, Bing, and Yahoo, the big three basically, have started realizing that a lot of times you're using a screen a lot like this. It just works like a word processor, and you're going to pick whatever you like the look of. So the big guys don't care if you used a three instead of a one. They just like the fact that you did make something a heading. 
Now, if you do pick a, a particular kind, like I made this a heading three, then I do recommend being consistent. Next time you make a page, also make the starting of it a heading three. You know, that way your pages match. You want some consistency from page to page to page. But don't worry that picking one versus another is going to score any arbitrary amount of points for Google or Bing. They don't really care. They just want to see that you're emphasizing something somewhere somehow. But that's really about it for headlines. Actually, I guess one more thing to mention is you may want to do more than one headline on a page. Uh, let's say um, some other local attractions to consider and maybe uh, link one, link two. Maybe I want this to be a headline as well. Feel free to have more than one headline on a page, especially if your page is going to talk about a couple of different things in one swoop. Now that is it for headlines. Now the next thing I want to talk about is page titles and descriptions. Now um, to do a page title or a description, what you do is you scroll down after you're done writing the stuff for your visitor. Go down like you're about to hit our save button and you're going to see the section called search engine tools right here. And there's a title, keywords, and description field. Now something to keep in mind here, I'm actually I'm going to go ahead and pull up Google real quick and let Google explain some of this to you. Now I've Googled the question, does Google use keywords? Because that used to be the end all be all for optimizing a website. You used to figure out what keywords you should use and you used to put those in there in that same section we've got for keywords. But Google has answered back that they do not use keywords. This first result here is from Google's own blog and it's not really new news as far as Google goes. This post came out in 2009 and Google says that they don't use keywords. However, this uh, link right here tags that Google understands. So I want to see a list of what Google wants you to do basically. And here's Google's list. Now it looks rather technical but I'm going to uh, distill it a little bit easier. Basically Google wants each page to have this stuff on here. And here's the breakdown. Here's descriptions. Here's titles. These are the two things that we're going to do together. Now everything below these top two, so the robots, the uh, the content type, the translate type, the uh, the refresh rate, all the stuff I just highlighted, we are already putting in there for you. We're going to handle that so you don't have to worry about any of this programming stuff. So that really only leaves description and title. That's the only pieces in Google's bl blueprint that we need to worry about. So when we're down here, you can blank out this keyword box. Google's okay with you doing that. Bing and Yahoo are actually the same way. Now, Google led the pack in 2009. Bing and Yahoo followed in 2010 and 2011. But those guys right there are 94% of search engines, if not more. So you don't have to worry about keyword formulas anymore. Now, as far as titles and descriptions go, you still don't need to put Google in the driver's seat for what you decide to write here. What you really need to happen is sell yourself to your visitors. So I'm going to pull up another search result where I've Googled relocating to Oklahoma City. Now, as I'm looking through these results as a consumer and I'm trying to figure out who I want to actually click on, I'm going to read the part right here that's the link. And this just says moving to OKC. If I'm not really sure, then I'll read the description down here. Considering moving to OKC, your next hometown may just surprise you. So I'm interested. I might go ahead and give this a click. Now, uh, since I typed relocating, you'll notice that this result doesn't say relocating. It says moving. Search engines are smart enough that if you say one thing and they Google another, if they're the same thing, search engines will still give you a, a free pass on that. You don't have to hit the nail right on the head like you used to. It's all plain language. Just write a page for a visitor, put whatever you want in the title and description box. As long as it's interesting to somebody, 10 tips for relocating. People like lists. I figure they might go ahead and check it out. That's a good title. Now, um, since you may not be able to say everything you want in the page title, like uh, down here, 30 things you need to know about Oklahoma City before dot, dot, dot. Oops, I can't tell what they're saying here. This is actually a pretty bad example. If I was the owner of this site, I would either shorten that or I would make this description say, before what? Before you move? Before you relocate? They didn't have enough room. Your description field is your overflow. If you need to say more than you can say here, 
say it right here, basically. That's really the only rule. Use plain language that gets somebody from the search result to your site. Because it doesn't matter if you're the first or second person on Google if nobody ever clicks on you. If search engines see that people skip you and they go to number two, then you're not going to be number one for very long. You're going to go uh, number two or less at that point. Now the last thing I want to talk about while we've got an editor pulled up is links from one page to another. Now this plays directly in line with what I talked about at the end of the last slide where you want to keep people looking at more than one page on your website. Search engines track that. They want to make sure people don't just look at your home page and then go away. The more pages somebody looks at, the more search engines feel like they were interested in you. Uh, but also, the more pages somebody sees, the more likely they're going to be to fill something out. They'll be more likely to fill in a lead capture form after 10 pages than they will after two pages. So you want them to see more of your site. It'll warm them up. Now, a good model to follow is Wikipedia. When you go to Wikipedia and you look up something, there will be links within one article to a bunch of other articles. You type in Civil War, and as you're reading the general story of it, you can click to read more about each individual battle, each act of Congress, each famous general, without having to go back up into the menu or the search bar. You want that same kind of easy way to get through your content that Wikipedia has. So it could be as simple as right here, link for more information about Bricktown, or maybe click here for listings in the downtown area. And I'm going to highlight this and send them there. So you can use links to put visitors where you think they may already want to go, it's something that's related to what they just got done reading, or you can also use this to send somebody where you want them to go uh, because there's another obstacle you want to solve or maybe you want to introduce them to your testimonials and see if they're ready to go ahead and fill out a form yet. So to make this a link, I'm going to highlight it, come up to custom links, and now you've got a menu to look through. Now, where it says My Selected Content, what this means is it's going to show you a list of the pages that are already in your site's menu. Each of these items under this little tree are buttons. This is in my menu. This is in my menu. But non-selected content is for linking to a page that's not in your menu. So earlier when I was talking about how you might consider putting pages on the chopping block because your site's starting to get hard to use, you can turn it off in your menu so your menu is super simple and clean, but that doesn't mean that you cut that content out of your site completely. You can still link to it if you want. Just put that link in one of your pages and visitors will still find it. But the most likely thing you're probably going to do is just help somebody find one of your content buttons so that you save them the learning curve. So I'm going to send them to my central OKC page. Just click on the name of the page, and that is now a link. If you've got an excuse to do that, go ahead and put links throughout the whole page if you want. Make your page like a glorified table of contents with some uh, context around it for why somebody should click on some of this stuff. All right, so now we're done with what to do to a content page. There's two more things I want to talk about, then we're done with content, and we'll move on to lead capture, which just takes a couple minutes, and marketing, which takes a couple minutes. So the stuff we've talked about so far, by the way, is probably the bulk of the homework. The rest of this is pretty quick work. But before I leave talking about content, I want to mention that blog posts can follow the same rules. Um, I'll go ahead and pull up the dashboard and show you how to do a blog post, and I'll show you what I mean. So here's where you make a content page, and right above it is where you make a blog post. Now for blog posts, we've taken a lot of the noise down. There's not as much stuff to fill in or choose when you're doing a post, because posts are meant, meant to be just little nuggets of information. But whatever you put here in the subject field is used the same way as a headline or a title. We use it for both, basically. So we're going to automate some of this for you. Now you can also use your blogs to link to your pages. You know, talk about a subject, tell them to click your page for more information. You can do the same tactics there. Um, now, I'm going to get into a little bit more specific stuff about blogging on the second half of the class when we talk about uh, um, social media because a lot of the same rules apply there for what kind of stuff should you talk about. Uh, but I want to just mention that uh, blogging, that counts toward your content rules too. Now, the last thing I want to mention is sitemaps. Now, all a sitemap does is get Google, Bing, or Yahoo 
to scan all the stuff we just talked about. It'll scan the pages we built, it'll scan your headlines, your titles, your descriptions, your links, and Google, Bing, or Yahoo will tell you if any of that needs attention. They'll, text, they'll, they'll test your links, they'll tell you if they're broken, they'll test your titles and your descriptions, and they'll tell you if they're too long or too short, they'll tell you if your titles or descriptions are too similar on some of your pages so that they can't tell one page from another. They like them to stand out. So you can get a report from these guys just within a couple of uh, a couple of quick steps. So if you want to do that, if you want to have Google or Bing analyze your site, then from this Publish tab, go to Website Content page, and then come up here to where it says Search Engine Tools. Now once you're here, over on the left, we've got step-by-step -step instructions for the Google site maps and the Yahoo sitemaps, which is also Bing, basically. Um, you can do both of them if you want, although uh, a lot of times it'll be redundant, but it is good to get a second opinion from a voice that matters and have Google tell you the stuff you might need to fix. All right, so now we're going to talk about some quick lead capture stuff, and then we'll get into marketing, which will only take a couple of minutes. Uh, most of what I wanted to get into on lead capture is things not to do and what you should do instead, really. Um, most of lead capture, the real trick is all about message, saying the right stuff. But there's also a bunch of tools that can end up turning people away if you use them incorrectly. So the first item I wanted to mention is I'm not a big fan of, on real estate sites, getting somebody to register before they use your IDX to search for a property. Uh, the downside is that, again, you're, you're competing against homes.com and Realtor and the big guys. They don't have to register there. So if they have to register on your site, they're going to go there. They're going to leave your site and choose somebody else. So instead of making them register at the beginning, I recommend coming up with ways to get them to register while they're using your site. They're already a couple of feet forward. Maybe they'll go ahead and keep up the momentum. Uh, now, one of them is already built in. There's a feature called Property Binder. And what Property Binder does is when somebody is looking at listings results, like this uh, Putnam City Schools page that I have pulled up, I can save it right from here. And there's my sign-up form. I can do the same thing with any listings I like. So this is, if they if they like what they're seeing, it's just a couple of mouse clicks, and then they're a lead. You're not hitting them over the head with it, though. Now, you can also increase the likelihood that they'll do that by having more of those custom landing pages. So I had a bunch of those in my menu up here at the top. I'm on the Putnam City Schools page, but I have some for other schools, other parts of town. And if I hit the nail on the head here and one of these pages had exactly what somebody wanted, they might pull it up and then immediately click Save because they like it. This takes the amount of steps for somebody way down and gets them more likely to actually take that next step. Now, another real estate example is I'm not a fan of telling somebody, just tell me what you want and I'll find it for you. Because these days, it's not that hard to look through inventory. People don't really see the value in that when there's so many search engines out there. So I don't recommend leaning on this pitch too much. You can if you want, but I really recommend beefing up your site's content instead. Because since listings are so easy to find, you should consider putting stuff on your site that isn't so easy to find, uh, like area information. I mentioned this when I was talking about content. It is some great content to add to your site. People can find listings, but they won't know much about the area. Why should they live there? What kind of attractions and things to do? Make a page that says, here's five country clubs you might be interested in. Here's a couple of uh, golf places. Here's uh, uh, three gated communities that are, that are great for active adults or something along those lines. Now, actually, do watch out b before using certain language unless it's actually an approved community for that sort of thing. You've got to watch out about e equal housing opportunity and not mentioning that something is good for demographics or minorities or anything along those lines. Uh, also consider offering reports about neighborhoods. Somebody might ask for what are home values doing in that area. We have a free iPad app called Refocus, R-E-Focus, that uh, it's only available in certain areas, but it is free. Uh, we will use MLS data to help you build pie charts and graphs and things along those lines. Or you can punch some numbers in Excel or your MLS may have some tools, but don't give that stuff away. Tell somebody that you can build those reports for them. That's way more useful than shopping for them. Now, something I've seen all kinds of sites do is doorway forms. These are basically like when you go to a content page, and before you can read the page, something pops up at you. Uh, this is old school marketing, and it turns a lot of people away. 
So instead of greeting them with a pitch that they have to see, I recommend ending a page with the right pitch. They don't have to fill in a pitch, but it's there and it's handy. Uh, an example is, let me go up here to my For Sellers page. And I've got a pitch on this page, but it's not aggressive. Somebody can read this article all they want, but in the end, there is a form. And if they want to fill it in, they can. Now, if I put the right form here, something that's actually useful to them, they might go ahead and do so after my article warms them up a little bit. This is a safe way to do it because you can do this on any page, and it's not going to scare anybody off. So if you want to do that kind of lead capture model, which is way more friendly, go here under the Capture tab of our dashboard and click Website Lead Form. Now you can use this next screen like a checklist. It has all your pages in it alphabetically. Here's nine steps to owning, followed by closing costs. And if I want to put a form on any of these pages, I just click Edit Settings and then pick the form. Now it does give you options for those pop-up doorway forms on the right, but this is what I'm recommending that you don't do. I don't recommend too many doorway forms, but putting an embedded form, it's not going to turn anybody off. Just make sure that you put selling forms on selling pages, buying forms on buying pages. Uh, for mortgage users, you can put our, our pre-qual form on um, pages about credit. You can put our refi form on your refi pages. You'll have different forms depending on the market, and if you need to make up your own forms for any reason, if you got something really special, uh, or a problem you want to solve or something like that. Over here on the left is Form Manager. You can make as many special forms as you want. Here's a couple of dummy forms I put together. Testimonials. Just click Create a Form, build it, and then go back to that Website Lead Form tab and start sprinkling that on any pages where you think it will be useful. That is the real trick. Just have useful forms on relevant pages, and it'll make sense why you're asking them to contact you without you having to hit them over the head with it, basically. Now, I'm also not a big fan of newsletters in general. Uh, if you've got a newsletter and it, it does stuff for you, that's great. I'm not trying to put it down or anything. But a lot of people are leery about signing up for something that's called a newsletter because they don't necessarily see the value in it. Uh, it's more useful to put stuff on your site that has an obvious value. Uh, a good example is our ebooks. So, our ebooks, I've got a bunch of them on this website. I have them under here. Here's my Distressed Homes ebook, Marketing Mistakes ebook. And what these do is I tell somebody a little bit about what they'll learn. And if they want to learn about it, they put in their contact info and hit download. And they get a personalized PDF from this agent that has information that will help them make sure that their home sells because they take care of these seven reasons that are in their way, basically. Now, if you want to set up an ebook, it's just a couple of mouse clicks to do so. Let me pull this on over. Right here under the Capture tab is ebook landing page. And the only thing you have to do is pick a subject, tell us a little bit about yourself, which you only have to do once. We'll reuse it the next time you set one of these up. Hit Save and you're done. You don't have to retype any of this stuff unless you want to because we power this by Ghostwriter. We make sure that this ebook is unique. So just a couple of mouse clicks and you'll have something that's a bit juicier than just a newsletter. Uh, now also in lieu of a newsletter, you might recommend that somebody subscribes to your blog or video content is useful too. Maybe you have a YouTube channel they might consider following uh, or other social media. People would rather consume stuff like this then get another email in their inbox. Now another example for real estate, and then we're done with this slide, um, I don't recommend leaning too heavy on promising somebody a comparative market analysis. Um, the reason is a lot of people right out of the box don't know the difference between your home value versus what Zillow tells them their home is worth. So if you're going to talk about helping somebody find out their home value, I recommend you fluff up the language a bit in a way that throws Zillow under the bus because that is a real battle you probably have to fight every day already. Um, talk about your real value versus a computer model. Talk about how if it's not priced, it won't sell. Or talk about how they could lose thousands or that a bad Zestimate can burn deal. You can get people that walk away from the closing table because you're leaning on a, Z uh, a Zestimate as your asking price. You've got to make sure that you talk about the real world pain points that they should choose an agent not a computer to tell them what their home is worth. 
All right, now this next bit of the class is going to go pretty quick. Um, we're talking about the the red slice of that pie that we were getting into in the beginning, but back to the big picture of, uh, of getting results. Um, now to make this part as quick and easy on you guys as possible, I've put together a list of sites that I recommend that you guys join that'll take care of a lot of this stuff as a bit of a checklist. I'm going to go ahead and pull up that list here for you guys. So here's the crux of what I recommend as far as marketing goes. There's a bunch of places that you can exist online without paying a dime. These sites can send you traffic. And now some of them will solicit to you. Like here's Yahoo's local listings. Now you can join them for free for a basic profile. They will ask $10 a month if you want to enhance your profile, but you don't have to enhance it. None of these cost anything. Your competitors are probably already on some of these. In fact, you may already be on some of them without even knowing it. Uh, I recommend going through this list and seeing if you're already there, and if you are, claim that profile so you can see how many hits those sites are sending you, how many people are checking you out. Now this is part of what we call inbound marketing, which is where we do things that get people to come to you naturally versus you shouting them down with paid advertising and things along those lines and just spinning your wheels and burning your wallet basically. Uh, inbound marketing is like a magnet instead of a bullhorn, and it's really easy to become a magnet without doing anything that takes a degree of time or money. Uh, so we're going to try and get you traffic from those big sites that are on that list. You've got to exist where your competitors exist too. You don't want to miss out on that stuff. Now, as you're checking out those other sites and joining, make sure that you use the same contact info there that you do everywhere else. Uh, by the way, I'm double checking to make sure I've got everybody's email address. Uh, John, I think I'm missing an email address for you, so if you get a chance, type it into the chat pod there and I'll make sure you get a copy of this list. Um, but everybody's going to get a copy of that list. Join as many of them as you have time. That's all it costs is time. And after you do, I also consider nurturing your visitors to leave you online ratings and reviews and testimonials. Uh, now what that does is let's say you don't choose to pay Yahoo $9.95 a month for an enhanced listing, but you get your visitors to find you on Yahoo and leave you ratings and reviews. The people with a good rating show right next to the ones who are paying Yahoo. So Without opening up your wallet, you can rank as well as the paid person, basically. You, you can fake it for free, basically. Now, also, this does affect your search engine rank to a certain degree, too. This shows that you're social and you're connected with other people. It shows that you're legitimate. You've jumped through some hoops to exist in these other places. Riffraff on the street and fly-by-night companies can't be on these other pages. Only a legitimate, verifiable business gets on there. So once you sign up, you've got some trust behind you. Now another thing that this does is it builds bridges that will send you highway traffic. You don't want to just be on an island hoping a, a boat swims by. You want to make sure that you have highways sending high traffic to you. Any of these are potential sources of visitors and business. All roads should lead to you. Now this also affects your search engine rank too. The site over on the left that I've colored red, they exist on Facebook and Twitter and LinkedIn and Yellow Pages, which is good for them, but that's only four places that are voting for their search engine score. Search engines count certain sites as votes. The site on the right, on the other hand, is in a bunch of different places. They're in more than 20 websites. Search engines see that they are all over the place. People are talking about them. There's some buzz, so to speak, basically. We want this to happen for you, and you don't have to pay for that to happen. Now, there is a little bit of fine print on the linking side, too, just like there was some fine print when it comes to content. Not all content is created equal. Not all links are created equal. Uh, so if you're going to get links from other places, beyond the list I'm going to send everybody, uh, keep in mind that some of these will have more of an effect on your rank than others. First off, it helps if the site linking to you is in a similar industry, not necessarily the same industry. You don't have to r rank up your competitors, but mortgage brokers and real estate agents can link to each other, appraisers and inspectors and title companies. You guys do business as colleagues, so you're qualified to link to each other as far as search engines go. They see that you have a lot in common. Also, if you have stuff in common geographically, if you're all in the same market, basically, search engines count that as well, too. You can promote local businesses, and local businesses can promote you. Uh, there are also other sites that carry even more of a high value as far as if that site links to you, it'll have an impact on your rank. 
Uh, the internet yellow pages, the ones that are on the list I'm going to send everybody, those definitely count. But also the more ratings you have on those pages, the higher the value. So you should really encourage people to give you testimonials there versus just sending it to you for a page. It helps if it's the other site voting for you, not your own site voting for itself. Uh, you can also consider getting some stuff that you've written published elsewhere. Um, an example is, let's say you wrote a great blog post about uh, what's affecting somebody's resale value or some personal finance tips. Now, you're an expert in that subject. You're a real estate agent who knows the market or you're a, a mortgage broker who knows finance. Uh, if you find a blog that's about that subject, they may love to get that kind of content from you. Uh, even newspapers are the same way. Editors would love to have something written by an expert versus a staff writer and if you tell them that they don't have to pay you for it they'll love it even more it'll be more likely to get published and those are authoritative sites if a news site or a, or a topic focused blog mentions you search engines see that as some real buzz that that is press it's like being interviewed on the news and some suddenly everybody knows your name basically uh, and also don't forget about known industry websites too those count towards votes too it's it, it's a similar industry basically so if you have a profile on active rain or a free profile on realtor or zillow those count too basically all right, now the last thing I want to talk about today is some quick social media and blogging tips. Uh, now these do play a small role in your search engine rank, not a huge role because it's just content basically and it follows the same, role as, uh, same rules as everything else. But for some visitors, this may be the preferred way that they break the ice with you. For a lot of people, they don't want to fill in a lead capture form. It's too much steps. Or maybe they don't want to give up too much information right now, but they're interested enough that they'd like to keep hearing from you. They want to know what you have to say. So if all they have to do is click like or follow on a social media badge on your website, like the ones I've got uh, down here, Facebook and Twitter and Pinterest, if all they have to do is click one of these badges and click like, then at least you've got them. At least they're going to pay attention to the stuff that you say on that page versus wandering off and forgetting that you exist later on. It's a great way to make sure that they at least stay tuned in. Now, um, to make sure that they have stuff to tune into, the average social media profile gets updated about one to two times a week. It's not an everyday thing. You don't want to be annoying with something to say every hour or anything along those lines. It should be one or two times a week. The average blog is about a one or two time a month sort of thing. Not quite as regular, but uh, again, you don't want to go dark for too long. And regardless of whether you're blogging or doing social media, you don't have to talk about homes for sale or open houses or loans because you're going to have some people who follow you who want other stuff from you. Uh, you may even have past clients and they're not shopping anymore. They're going to tune out if all you talk about is your product. So talk about other things that might be relevant like upcoming events, news that affects them, finance, uh, home values, um, home improvement tips, finance, uh, uh, credit improving tips, things along those lines. What's going on in your market and your area? Uh, you may be the person that they keep following because you talk about things that affect them in the real world even though they're not buying or selling from you anymore. <clears throat> also some cheap ways to put some content on your, into your social media page is to share what your site already has. You can share your content pages, your ebooks, your blog posts, or our Inspire Me tool which I'll show here in a little bit. So here under our Promote tab if you want to share something via social media for some quick, easy content, you can share your listings or your open houses. In fact, let me do an open house real quick. Oh, I don't have any scheduled. Tell you what, I'm going to do a uh, content page instead. <clears throat> now, I'm going to share my home appreciation page. Actually, let me do Putnam City Schools. And I'm going to hit continue. And I'm going to say... Uh, find out more info about the popular Putnam City School District, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, <clears throat> uh, which is a very popular topic in my area. A lot of people want to move to that school district. It's got great schools. Now, I won't say great schools because that breaks EHO, but I will point them to the page that has factual information, and they'll figure out that it's great schools. Then I'll hit continue. 
and I can either post it now or I can actually schedule it so you can sit down and you can plan months worth of social media posts in advance while you've got time so that if you get busy your social media pages don't go dark you can schedule as many of these as you want in fact the reason I wanted to do open house earlier is maybe I'm gonna post about it now I'm gonna post about it a couple of days before and then the morning of and then I'm gonna thank people for attending later that day I could schedule all of that now even before the open house is kicked off basically now you can also share your blog posts as you make them. A lot of people won't subscribe to your blog's email newsletter. They'll just click like or follow and follow you on Facebook, but you can tell them, hey, I've got a blog. Come check out this article. It's summer in Oklahoma City. Here's some things to do. Works the same way. Hit continue. Tell them a little bit about it and then decide if you want to post it now or schedule it for another day or time. You can also see what's scheduled down here at the bottom. Here's the stuff you've already done. Here's the stuff that's coming up, something I'm going to post on the 2nd, something I'm going to post on the 16th. All right, so there's some of this stuff that I've talked about today that you're just going to sit down, just knock it out, and it's going to be off your plate. But some of the things, some of the things I talked about are the sort of thing you'll want to take a look at and measure and see if you need to change it up a little bit later. Um, the whole goal here is I don't want you guys to sit still. Your competition is not going to sit still for you so that you can outrank them. They're going to shift every time they see their ranking slips. So ways to keep up on that and stay top of mind to your visitors while you're at it is if you start blogging and making social media posts, keep blogging and making social media posts. Uh, again, you can promote your site's content and your blog posts right back to social media so that those pages don't go dark. And you can schedule stuff so that if you're busy now, uh, it doesn't reflect on your Facebook page. Um, also, if somebody does become a lead, don't forget about our nurture tab. We have a whole tab in our dashboard, I'll pull up here, we talk about it in a little bit more detail in our Kickstarter classes on Mondays and Fridays, but after they give you their contact info, put them into an email campaign. Make sure that their, their inbox doesn't go dark from hearing from you either. Maybe they didn't follow you on your blog or your Facebook. Maybe they only use email. Nurture those people for, for future business too. A lead isn't a promise that they're going to choose you. Also, I talked about different content pages and different lead capture tactics. You may try something and have it not stick, so you might have to fine tune it later on and get the message down. Message is the real crux of lead capture. You might say something and have it not click and need to go back and say something else. Try a different pitch. Now, to track all of this stuff so that you know where to double down, where to shift if it's not working, uh, we've got some tools built in to help you measure this stuff. Just scroll down in the dashboard a bit. Here's how your traffic is doing, the ups and the downs. Here's how your email campaigns are working. Here's your most popular pages, and you can drill in beyond that, too, if you want. Here's what sites are linking to you and what those links are. Like a bunch of Naples websites are promoting me, for example. Scrolling down will even tell you how your social media stuff is measuring up, how many people are sharing you and following you and so forth. Now the good news is, uh, even though I talked about a lot of different things today, none of it has to cost anything. It's all about how you stretch your mind and your time, not how you stretch your wallet. So hopefully I've given you guys enough things to try that, uh, you, know, you know, feel free to try a couple of them, come back, refresh your memory. I'm going to make sure everybody gets a copy of these slides so that uh, you, know, you can go back in and, and uh, check which things you haven't tried yet. I want to make sure you got plenty of options because hopefully one of those options will be a good success story for you. Now, I've left some room open at the end of the class in case you guys want to ask some questions, but also if you have things that come up after these sessions, there's lots of different ways you can connect with us. Uh, I definitely recommend following us on social media. That's one of the quicker ways to hear about what's coming up. Uh, we are on Facebook and Twitter and Google+. On the Pipeline website, here's our badges up here. We also have a blog, but we'll share our blog articles on social media so that you'll hear about it if you follow us. Uh, we have a lot of self-help that's built into our dashboard too, so as you're exploring the tools I've been showing, let me scroll back up here. If you're under the Nurture tab and you want to know more about what you can do here, there's a video on the right. If you go to the Capture tab, there's a video on the right that's about capture. And if you click on that video, or actually, I'm sorry, if you... Uh, hover over one of these items like ebook landing page you can click learn more right here and you'll see a video about that 
So we've tried to include a little video tour guide as you're exploring so you don't get lost and you can see all the different options for things you can put together here. Uh, now we also have different classes coming up. Our new user classes are Monday afternoons and Tuesday mornings. We reteach this results class on Tuesday mornings and Wednesday afternoons. So there's two different days and times for each of those classes, so hopefully you get a chance to catch those. And uh, Thursdays we teach a, a Q&A where you guys call the shots. You tell us what you want answered for you on Thursdays and uh, we'll cover whatever it is. So here's our schedule. Now you can also connect with us by phone, too. Our phone number is right up here in the upper left-hand corner. Um, our email address is right here. It is actually an email address that gets checked. Uh, but feel free to just give us a ring and get us on the phone if you've got some more questions. But uh, I've said my piece here. Uh, if you guys have any questions, feel free to let me know in the text chat pod, and I'll answer them. I'll leave them open uh, as you guys are typing them. But I hope that I've given you guys some ideas that end up doing well for you. I want to hear some good success stories from you guys eventually.